I don't think it's all of European history. I don't think it's all European countries. I certainly don't think it's spread out equally across Europe. I think it's particular places at particular plot times influenced by particular ideas. And I think the ideas that dominate what we think of as Western civilization are the ideas of the Enlightenment. The ideas primarily of the 18th century that came about primarily in England and Scotland and, and in France and in other European centers of thought. Of course, those ideas were developed and established on the basis of discoveries and ideas and aesthetics of the Renaissance. So it has a, it has a tradition that goes back, but I think it coalesced on a particular civilization that we recognize today as Western during the Enlightenment. And there were two fundamental ideas that I think represent Western civilization and differentiate it, both from the past in terms of what, the, what Europe was like, or, or, or this particular geographic area, and from the rest of the world uh, during the period of the ascent of Western civilization. And those two ideas are reason the efficacy of reason, the primacy of reason, reason as the means of attaining knowledge. What was the way to attain knowledge before this idea that reason is the means to do it? Where, do, where does knowledge come from, if not for reason? Well, for, for, for centuries, it was by means of some form of revelation, whether we each practiced that revelation independently as individuals, or whether we had a a, uh, a, a pope figure that practiced the revelation himself, or whether there was some other former philosopher king that discovered the truth and conveyed it to us, we as individuals were not expected to think for ourselves, we're not expected to have the capacity to know the world for ourselves. But that all changes somewhere around 1700. That changes with the scientific revolution, suddenly, there are scientists out there explaining the world to us in ways that we can all understand. Suddenly there are things that everybody can pretty much figure out. We don't need revelation. We don't need a philosopher king to tell us why things act. We actually have a scientific method that we can use to discover these things. And I think in that sense, Newton is as part of the Enlightenment as is John Locke, as are the great philosophers. The scientific revolution cannot be separated from the political revolution that is happening at that time. It's all about the discovery of the efficacy of this tool, this amazing tool that we have. And if you look at other cultures in the world, if you look at other civilizations in the world, it just doesn't happen over there. It, it doesn't happen in China. There's never this respect for the human mind, and there's never this discovery of a method for using the mind. If you look at India, if you look at South America, if you look at any civilization, the one thing they're always missing is this idea that we have a conceptual mind that is capable of knowing the world and there's a method to its use. That's, I think, the differentiating factor between what becomes Western civilization and the rest of the world. And of course, that idea comes from the Greeks. That idea comes primarily from Aristotle. That idea comes from a Greek philosophical tradition that then is rediscovered by Thomas Aquinas and kind of integrated into the Catholic Church and comes, really manifests itself and flourishes during the Enlightenment. Of course, the second idea is the implication of the first. If we all have the capacity to think for ourselves and discover truth about the world for ourselves, then why can't we decide who to work for or what a profession to have? Right before that, you couldn't. Why can't we decide who to marry? That didn't exist before like the 18th, 19th century. And in some parts of the world to this day, it doesn't exist. Huh? Why can't we decide who our leaders should be and what kind of life we should live and how to engage in that life? If we have this capacity to reason, why can't we apply it on our own values, on our own decisions? And that's the idea of individualism, the sanctity of the individual. The individual is no longer a tool to be sacrificed for the group, the collective. I think the best political manifestation for this in, in, in written form is the Declaration of Independence, the American Declaration of Independence, which is a, 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 a core part of what I consider Western civilization. All of those ideas, the idea of the efficacy of reason, the idea of individualism, are today challenged within what we consider the West, and have of course been challenged for generations outside of what we consider the West. 
by thinkers everywhere else around the world. So I think it's under assault. And yet, I think there are few thinkers in the West who understand what Western civilization is. There are few people who really comprehend it and are therefore willing to fight for its preservation. And as a consequence, those philosophies, those ideas that are anti the ideas of individualism and reason and everything that implies, I think it implies capitalism, it implies freedom, political freedom, those ideas are withering away as the offensive from alternative ideas intensify and those who stand for those ideas become a smaller and smaller minority. That's the pessimist side. That's the idea that, that it is indeed dying. I'll just end with one positive, right? The positive is that for the first time in, in, in history, Western ideas are not the exclusive monopoly of the West. <clears throat> That is, today, ideas are available to everybody at any time, anywhere in the world. The renaissance of capitalism and freedom and these ideas might not be in Europe or the United States. It might be in Asia, it might be in Africa, it might be somewhere else, because the ideas, the ideas of the Enlightenment, the ideas of Aristotle, the art, the, uh, the, the, the expression of those ideas and aesthetics is now available to everybody. And since these ideas, I believe, are universal, they're not connected to a history or to a skin color or to an ethnicity, but are truly universal, these ideas could manifest themselves anywhere in the world, and to some extent already have, to the extent that Asia has been successful, it has been, they have taken the, the ideas to some extent seriously. The idea of science and reason and individualism. When you go to China, if you go to Shanghai, it's not your vision of collectivism. <laughs> they build whatever skyscrapers they want and they're all interesting and original. And the people walking the street are dressed individualistically and yelling at one another as only individualists can yell at one another. <laughs> collectivists don't yell at one another. They just, you know. <laughs> it's, it's a vibrant place. And it, that might be changing, but my point is that Western civilization, its core elements have been exported to the rest of the world. And I don't think the genie can be put back in the, in the bottle. I don't think that can be taken, sucked out. So even as Europe, Western Europe is under threat, even as the United States in many respects is under threat, the ideas are surviving and thriving elsewhere and I think will survive and will thrive. And in that sense, Western civilization will not die. Uh, it will just express itself differently, maybe in a different place. Hopefully not, hopefully still here, but it will express itself differently one day. Thank you. So thank you very much for that. Well, Garen previously said that, so the attack is primarily coming from within, it's not coming from the outside. Um, do you don't entirely agree with that? I don't, but let me first of all say it's a great place to be back in Sweden um, and very nice to see everyone uh, out here tonight. Uh, I, I just came from uh, your public radio uh, where I was reminded of uh, the fact that the debate in your country on many issues is somewhat different than it is in mine. <laughs> Delighted to have been asked on, uh, but I did. I did say something. What I would think was rather moderately offensive about one of your former prime ministers, and uh, was was fascinated, to, like treading on ice. Just <laughs> check. Um, I don't think I went through, but uh, anyhow, we have a very robust debate, including being very insulting about former prime ministers where I'm from. So, <laughs> uh, with good reason. Um, <laughs> Let me next just uh, make a couple of very general opening points and then I'll respond to a little bit of what, what Your Honour has just said. I think we are in agreement on, on, on a large amount of this. I think the disagreements we have are, are of consequence. And uh, I'll just pick up on one thing you, you finished with. That. I, I, I agree myself that, that, that elements of Western civilization um, are visibly able to be transplanted in other parts of the world. Um, you're right, China, capitalism, individualism, not, not freedom, of course, um, which is an important one to miss out uh, for them. 
I was very struck recently by an interview with the, uh, um, a, a French philosopher, uh, Alan Finkelkraut, where he said something I thought very, very profound, where he said that he was specifically speaking about fr France, but I think what he said had, could, could be said almost in any Western European country. He said that we had had a period in, the, in, in our history, he said, where we thought that our values um, uh, should be transported around the world. <coughs> And uh, that slowly diminished, and then we got to a point where we thought, well, maybe our values are for these people, not for those, maybe. And he said, and now, in the 21st century, we're in this situation where we're wondering, can we at least still have them for ourselves? <laughs> it's a very profound observation, and, and I think there's a, what I describe as a certain European, modern European pessimism that, that, that comes from that feeling. Uh, maybe, maybe we could still keep it for ourselves. Um, now, my own view is, uh, and those of you who, who, who have uh, glanced at or indeed read uh, my um, latest book, Strange Death of Europe, which I think still has to come out in Swedish, but is coming out in Swedish. Swedish translation is, I think, the last translation. <laughs> You'll be amazed to hear. <laughs> But actually, it's, it's taken uh, Swedes even longer than it took the Italians to do their translations. <laughs> That's a real... <laughs> so there's a lesson in there somewhere. Uh, but uh, if, you've, if those of you read in English will, 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 will uh, anyway uh, know that... My own view is that this, this whole question has an us and them component. People hate us and them, them arguments. It's, it's very reductive, but every... Every uh, attempt to sum up things this complex is going to be reductive at some point. The them bit of what I've been discussing and writing about in recent years is the bit that, in my experience, people are most interested in. Um, it is the fact that we have been going through a very interesting process in Europe with the era of mass migration. Not migration, but mass migration, where we are going through an experiment to see whether or not our values are in very, very short spaces of time able to be transmitted swiftly to people with totally different value systems. Mm. And it's an experiment. We've decided to do an experiment on the only Petri dish we have. It's like <laughs> deciding to do an experiment for an amazing new idea you've had and injecting it into your only child <laughs> before doing any tests at all. Yeah. Yeah. But there we go. This uh, attempt to see whether or not we can transmit all of our values, learning and culture very fast to everybody who's come here, is a work in progress. But that first thing, the, the as it were, the then bit, uh, is the first component of this. Just the simple fact, and some people loathe this, some people love it, and most of us have very mixed feelings about it. But the fact that that mass movement of peoples has happened in Europe since the 1950s has very significantly changed Europe, has had all sorts of uh, consequences, some for the good, some not for the good, and we are picking our way through that. But it has had a profound and, I think, undeniable um, impact. But the second part, the bit that I find people are far less interested in talking about, but I'm actually much more interested in talking about in a way, is the us bit, the strange thing of why would anyone do this to themselves? Why would anyone go through this? Why would, what would, what would cause you to do something which in historical terms is, is pretty unnatural, or at least uncommon, to very fundamentally change your society in this particular manner? Now, the us bit, I think, is particularly interesting because, again, we're in the middle of it. And there's no way of knowing how it turns out. But my own view is that the, uh, the substructure of Western civilization has been <coughs> eroding for a long, long time now. I, I, I go into some of the specifics in, in the book. Uh, it's been happening in the realm of religion, very obviously. Uh, and again, you can like that or loathe it, but most of us have very mixed views about it. But it's, I think it's undeniable, the, uh, the slow withdrawing roar. And uh, it's been happening in the realm of culture and mind. 
But my own view is that this leaves us in this very complex position where we're wondering, as uh, Finkelkraut said, we're wondering if we can hold on to the bits that we still have. Now, my own suggestion is that there is something else going on at the moment, and I've been writing about this more recently for forthcoming book, is that there is an attempt to basically embed a new form of metaphysics in our societies, to try to rethink the whole thing, to say, well, look, we're in such a mess with our past, we're in such a mess with what we've had, that let's try to sort of start again. Let's, let's, let's revivify something, let's set new ground rules, what the new morality is, what the, the new interpretation of the West is. And I think that is, in itself, again, a, a fascinating and terrible experiment that's beginning. My own view is that the could we at least keep it for ourselves, is not an unvalid question, and not, not, not a question that should be replied to with the mockery, which it is, I think, generally replied to with. Um, what we have had in Europe, and what we still have, is not nothing. And historically is very rare. And I am constantly amazed by the mistaken uh, idea that this, that we have, what you have in Sweden, is the default position of mankind. Mm -hmm. That it's what happens whenever you throw people down, congregate, organize, and it basically always comes out looking like Stockholm does tonight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think this presumption is so wildly misguided that one of the most important things that we have to do is to keep saying to the people who, make, who have these presumptions uh, yeah. to lay out, first of all, why they think as they do in the face of extraordinarily strong uh, uh, evidence to the contrary. And secondly, to the people trying to embed this new kind of metaphysics we're getting into, a new type of religion, the people who speak about this civilization, this country, my country, this continent, who speak about it only in terms of grudge, of vengeance, of vendetta, never, never in the spirit of forgiveness or love or gratitude. I've always said this about my own views about what some people call nationalism or patriotism. Somebody said to me some years ago, you know, are you patriotic? And I said, I finally get this strange question to be asked. I said, I, I don't really know. I mean, I said, I just feel grateful, really about where I'm from. And I would like anyone who wants to be part of it to share in that gratitude. And I suppose that's one of the reasons why I'm so amazed that the other tone has become the normal tone. The thing of, I haven't been given enough. Other people have kept stuff from me. I'm of this minority, whether it's sexual, racial, whatever, and I'm owed something by somebody else. Powerful people are holding me down. If I could just squeeze them and then drink whatever it is that's produced when you squeeze them, we could all kind of come out exact, exactly the same. Screw that. It's a hideous idea that's being uh, pushed onto this, I think, particularly the younger generation on this. But as I say, it starts in some way with this fundamental thing of what is the attitude you have to the society and the culture which you're from? Is it, broadly speaking, one of this place has been a place of oppression, of racism, of sexism, of inequality, and on and on and on, compared to what? You never get told. But, but is it that, or is it, broadly speaking, to say, this, this has been an extraordinary ride so far. <laughs> and I'd like to see it continue. Um, I know which one I feel. But I know which one is being taught to a new generation as well. Anyhow, with that I hand over to you. <laughs> introductionary remarks. I thought we'd try and divide up the different maladies so we don't just end up with a big sort of mixed bowl of frustrations. Um, but we tried to pick them up one after one. 
Um, and I thought I'd, I'd like to go back to you, Douglas, um, about what you said, sorry, <laughs> about the, sort of the modern pessimism part, because I, I think that's intriguing. You warned against optimism. Why? I warned against optimism. Yes, well, I, I'm, I'm against optimism as an attitude. Which it usually is. I, 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 if, you ever, if you ever have to discuss anything of consequence with a politician, and you have a truth, and they don't, which does happen, you always find the politician will do the following move on you. They'll say, I guess I'm just more optimistic than others. <laughs> It's, it's a constant trick, this one. Well, I guess I'm just more optimistic than you, yeah. yeah. Uh, as if like, the most optimistic person in any situation wins. <laughs> I mean, there's all sorts of times it's very unwise to be optimistic. Very unwise to be standing at a bus stop and the bus has not come along for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> it's very unwise to be optimistic that it will at some point quite soon, so stay there another day. It's, it's, it's a strange thing that's built into almost all discussion. That pessimism, Roger Scruton, a great uh, philosopher from the UK, uh, uh, wrote a book some years ago called The Uses of Pessimism. And it's, it's a very, very interesting book. And I, I have to say, that as a default position, to be pessimistic also has its downsides, also is unwise in situations. So, so just all of these attitudes, in a way, we have to go beyond just if the, if the facts look good, you'll be positive about it. If they look bad, don't be. Dress them. And uh, uh, as I say, I'm amazed by the attitude of, 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 of politics and of, of indeed of philosophy as well. Um, I think there are all sorts of things which is worth being pessimistic about in order to, in order among other things, to warn yourself and to warn others. Uh, I mentioned earlier, I mean, I think that carrying out great experiments on a society and making the stakes this high is an unwise thing and would have been restrained if people had been more pessimistic. Uh, I mentioned this on the radio program earlier, but um, to, to do some of the things that we've done in recent decades um, and to say, well, if it, come, it will come out right. It has to come out right. It must come out right. Well, everything has the other opportunity as well. What if it goes wrong? What if this great experiment fails? What then? As I say, you've done an enormous experiment, the most lethal experiment imaginable, and it might not work. Um, yeah. I think that a good dose of pessimism might have helped earlier on on this. This is very complex stuff. It's not a science. Nobody knows how to do it. I, I've noticed this for years in an area I've written about a lot and studied a lot, so-called radicalization, which is one of the ways that people make a science out of something that isn't a science. There's always seven steps to de-radicalization, eight steps to radicalization, nine ways to make it up. The three Ps, the four Rs, the, they always come up with things like this. Nobody knows. It's not a science. It's a social science. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Not a science. And it's always presented as if it is. And as I say, I think maybe not pessimism, deep, deep skepticism about some of the things that have been going on, I think, is, is a very wise uh, um, attitude. And by the way, also conceding when, uh, when uh, pessimists are wrong. I mean, it's not like Again, this is the thing to do with the attitude. It's not like one wants to be pessimistic because it's just much more fun. <laughs> In fact, I have an example recently, if I may, sorry, slight divergence, but if I may give an example of this. Uh, it's been on my mind recently. I haven't written about it yet, but I, I, I'm planning to. Um, a very, very interesting thing happened. We, we're about to come up to the 30th anniversary of the fatwa issued uh, against Salman Rushdie for writing the Satanic Verses which in my country anyway, was a very, very important moment, and I think was globally. Uh, and something else has happened of much, much less import recently, but which struck me very deeply when it occurred. And pardon me going from the sublime to the possibly ridiculous, but um, not all of you will be familiar with the work of a pop band called One Direction. Um, I mean, obviously you all know the early work, but... Uh, um, <laughs> 
is a problem. And if any of you know, any of all, fine young guys who run a television show in the UK, I'll make a show. They run a television show in the UK and they form a pop band and they millions and millions of records, fans all around the world. And it was a nice representation of modern Britain. One with you know, nice looking young guys, and one of them was Irish, and one, one of them was a of, of Pakistani Muslim descent, it's the same matter. And uh, I mention this because uh, uh, some years ago he was in Istanbul and he sent out a tweet about, you know, there's only one God, Allah, and so on. Like, I remember noticing at the time, I thought, well, that's interesting. A few weeks ago, he gave an interview, this young guy, uh, to a, a magazine somewhere, and they asked him about his religion, and he said, I'm not, I don't consider myself a Muslim, anymore. I'm not religious anymore. And the reason I mention this is just because nothing happened. Nothing happened. It was the dog that didn't bark in the Sherlock Holmes story. <laughs> and I found that absolutely fascinating. So, and the reason I mention this is because if you're very pessimistic about immigration and so on, like I, to some extent, am, that's the sort of thing you wouldn't expect to happen. You would expect front page stories, you know, Imam issues death sentence on Zayn Malik of One Direction for leaving Islam. You know, Zayn Malik chased into hiding. But the point is, I'm saying, is that there's stuff like that going on which is very, very hard to quantify. And I'm not saying by any means I want that I think the solution to integration, or what I write about in my last book, is Zayn Malik. <laughs> very important that you don't. Get that as a takeaway. But that isn't nothing, because that means that within a generation, it may have become not completely safe, but a lot safer for actual freedom to move within religions and out of religions might be happening. So I, I, I give this somewhat long winded and esoteric example just to make that point that when evidence comes up that may be against. Something else. It's nevertheless very, very well worth paying attention to it. Thank you. <clears throat> um, well, I'll, I'm actually going to pose the same question to you, but maybe perhaps explain why I, I picked it in the first place. And that was that I think sometimes with the pessimism that you hear, you I think you might end up where some of the more hysterical environmentalists do when they say that, well, the Earth is screwed in 30 years' time, so stop driving a car. And it just makes very little sense to me why anyone would sacrifice anything or do anything differently or try to make things better if sort of the end game in the end is suicide, regardless. Is he where I'm coming from? Yeah, but the problem is I cannot say now that I'm an optimist after what you said. You make me the fool. Um, you know, but I am, right? And, and, and I am trying to assess the facts. And I'm not an optimist about a lot of what we're discussing today. So we'll get to this more pessimistic view of, of, of Europe, which I think is, is mostly right. Um, I am an optimist, and I'm an optimist basically for, for similar reasons as, I guess, Steven Pinker is. You know, I look at the world around, and it looks pretty good. Um, and yes, China is not free, and I, I wish it was, and it's heading towards less freedom, if anything. But given where they are, I, you know, 40 years ago, I couldn't even imagine them one day being free, because Mao Zedong was just, you know, a... a, a, a his authoritarianism was all encompassing. You couldn't imagine China would ever evolve from that. Today, I can imagine a China that's free one day. Not tomorrow, maybe not in 10 years, maybe not in 20 years, but one day. I don't see that value of freedom as anymore being linked only with Western civilization. I do think it is, it is a global value that it will take time. It didn't happen in the West without a lot of bloodshed and without a lot of fighting and a lot of, a lot of intellectuals advocating for it. And I think it can happen elsewhere. And I, and I, and I think the long-term trajectory is that it does happen in many of these countries, because I think in the end, truth works. And, I, and, and, and going back to what Douglas said about these, you know, these values, I still believe that Western values are universal. Universal. They apply to every human being on the planet. They don't know it yet. <laughs> right? And in that sense, maybe, you know, I'm, I'm a chauvinist or whatever you call. Uh, I believe that everybody benefits when they adopt kind of the, the values that we associate with Western civilization. 
Uh, it makes them richer, it makes them uh, freer, and it makes them happier, and it makes them spiritually, you know, better, because Western arts is better. It just is better. Um, so I think that these values are universal and that they will ultimately, because they are right, have an impact around the world. And to go back to my, my this idea of suicide, you know, there's no question that part of the part of what is killing the West is people coming in, and and let's <laughs> let's call it Muslims coming in, right? I, you're not allowed to say that in Sweden, I know, but but it's Islam that is that is in this case, uh, and because I, I don't, and we we might disagree on this, or might not, but I don't think that threat exists in the United States. I don't think that immigration in the United States has the same impact as immigration has in Europe, partially because it's not mass migration at the same levels as it is in Europe, but partially because I think different people with different ideas are coming in there than are in, in, uh, in Europe. I think Islam plays a big role here uh, in, in, in making it a threat. But I think the reason, first of all, you're running the experiment, but particularly with mass migration rather than normal migration, and the reason this experiment will probably fail is because of the rot that already existed in Western civilization to begin with. That it is the rot that makes it possible. This is often, you know, what, what caused the Roman Empire to fall? The barbarians. Well, yeah, kind of, but, but it was rotten already in, 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 inside. That is a confident, strong Rome of 200 years or 300 years earlier would have stood up to the barbarians and beaten them back and, and defeated them. It wouldn't have been an issue. And I think in this case, a strong West that understands the values and understands that they're universal and is willing to, in a sense, preach them, not literally preach them, but live them and expect others to live them. I think the external threat might still be there. The experiment might still be dangerous, but it would be much less dangerous. But what is that thought? Give us an example. <laughs> I mean, I think that rot is, um, you know, in, in, in today, postmodernism, the idea that there is no truth, that there is no reality, that there is no uh, set of, uh, of values that are actually universal and good for human beings, that rot is partially what Douglas described in terms of this idea that we are determined by our genes, and particular genes, because we, you know, we have different genes, so it's, you know, we're, we're different because of our sexual orientation or because of our particular gender, I guess they're not 32 or 98, or I, I lose track. <laughs> Nobody really knows, yeah, it's, it changes by the minute. Uh, you know, your values are determined primarily by the skin color or by your nationality, which is very, very strong in Europe, uh, rather than by your humanity, by your individualism, and by the use of your reason to discover those values. I think, I think so. I think that postmodern uh, leftist that lot has been eating away at uh, Western civilization since the last thing that ate away at Western civilization, which was communism and fascism. Right? These are also I, my world. Communism and fascism are anti-Western. They're not part of Western civilization. They're the negation of Western civilization. It's the, it's the anti-West rising up to try to defeat the Enlightenment and what the West actually represents. And I think those forces still exist in our culture in new forms. I, you know, I've criticized the left, so let's criticize the right. On the right, it's, it's, it's nationalism. Nationalism not as that kind of positive view of I was born in a good place and, 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 and I, I'm grateful to having been born. It's, it's this country and flag no matter what and, and I will never move and this is, this is it. Doesn't matter if my country's free or not free. I, you know, this is where I was born, therefore this is where I died. And, and that has become even more provincial so that uh, in, in America, one of the phenomena you see is people are moving less. One of the beauties of America used to be that if you lost your job in Ohio, you got in your car and you drove to Arkansas and you got a job in Arkansas. And people move constantly. And you can actually measure these things, their indexes of how often people move. They, they, they buy places in different, different states. People are not moving anymore in the United States. Hell, I was born in Ohio, I will die in Ohio, and I had a steel job and I expect to have a steel job when I die. Ain't happening, but you know, the expectation is there, right? So we become provincial, tribal, 
And both, I think this is a phenomena of, of, of the right now as a response to the left, but a phenomena of, of, of both, which I think is, is deeply, deeply uh, uh, troubling. And you know, maybe because I'm an immigrant, right? I wasn't born in one place. And actually, I often say my, my kids a fourth generation born on a different continent. So I am the classic wandering Jew, right? We wander. You know, my, my kids were born in America, I was born in Asia, I was born in Israel. My parents were born in South Africa, and their parents were born not far from here in Lithuania. So, you know, and, and, and who, long, who knows before that. So, you know, my perspective is that Mass immigration has happened in the past. And yes, partially it happened from, from Europe into the United States, and you could say similar cultures, but they weren't that similar. Um, you know, those Jews from the shtetl coming to New York had no concept of what a modern city looked like, had no concept what a modern life would be, had no concept what education was beyond the education of the Old Testament that they, they you know, in the in the, in the, in the cheder, which they sent their kids to, and they showed up in New York, and they, reality forced them to assimilate. Right? I think one of the ills of modern society is we've created a welfare state that doesn't force you to assimilate. We've created a society that says, don't assimilate because we're no better than you. Multiculturalism. I, I mean, all of these phenomena are part, the welfare state is part of the what that I think is part of Western civilization. It, it, it doesn't just, it, you know, make it more difficult for people to assimilate, but I think it makes it, uh, it makes it part of the squeezing of the tube, right? It's, it's, if, if we have a welfare state, it's a zero-sum game. Somebody's getting something at somebody's expense. What, I, what they're getting, I'm not getting, I want it. How come they got it, how come I didn't get it? It's, it's I, I have a right, I, I deserve, Give, you know, hand it over. It changes the mentality, it changes that mentality again, away from individualism, away from really evaluating reality as it is, but, but ex expectations and demands and, and, uh, and needs. Um, so, I, you know, I think all of these have been rotting Western civilization. I believe Western civilization would be dying even if we didn't have mass migration. What mass migration is doing is it accelerates it. It's like, a, it's like throwing fuel in a fire. It's, it brings out all the worst elements and, is, and, and the good elements are not being defended as a consequence. So I'm optimistic on, you know, globally, if you will. I'm optimistic about the human race and our ability to, to survive these things. I'm pessimistic in the short term and certainly pessimistic about what's going on in Europe today and what's going on in the United States today. It, it, it is scary. But that reaction, that counter reaction that you discuss on the right, that sounds a whole lot like identity politics to me, doesn't it? I mean, also within the critique of the postmodernism. Or what do you say, Douglas? Yeah. Let me also quickly uh, agree. Um, before I come to that, let me take a stab also at the, at the rot question. Um, the, the rot doesn't start from nowhere. It doesn't start from a place that isn't right in a way. What is? What is? What is? What is always the worst problem? A, a, a critique that is partly true. And in the case of Europe, uh, it's our 20th century. And it's not like we're very far away from that. You know, I mean, it may feel like that to some people. It may feel that to people born in the last you know, 19 years. But it isn't, it isn't that long ago. And we've just had the centenary of the... Uh, of the Commemorations of World War One, when, when Europe went to war, um, and destroyed a generation, and indeed destroyed something very fundamental at the heart of the culture. Um, and then again, of course, and I mean, so much. I say this obviously as, as a as somebody who thinks in a friendly way towards this country, but I think that this country, which had the most minimal involvement in World War Two, imagine, you're still haunted. You're still picking over it. You're still trying to find whether or not you've got a way out of the moral culpability or otherwise. So I don't need to tell you what it's like in countries a little further to the south, or indeed in any country in Europe. And so many realizations of that just keep coming. I mean, when you're on, when you just mentioned, you know, the Jews from the Shetland, I mean, one of the things that you just can never I was in Vienna again recently, and you know, I mean, I just was overwhelmed by it again. I, mean, I love that city, but it's, it's, 
it's a mausoleum as well. And, you know, you just have this feeling as you walk around the streets in Vienna, at least I do, maybe it's because I grew up in London and I spent a lot of my life in very, very big cities, but, you know, you, you get down the street and you think, why aren't there any people here? Like, wh why is there, like, a clattering of feet at the end of a cobbled street? And, and you just sort of think, you know, they killed the Jews. They killed all the Jews. And those Jews in Vienna were actually the people holding the culture. They were the ones holding European culture in their hands, furthering it, conducting it, singing it, writing it, preserving it, and taking it forward. How do you, how do you recover from that in a few decades? You know, so it's not like the guilt, the doubt, I write a uh, chapter on this in, in my book on guilt, which is a fascinating chapter. It's not like the guilt and the, 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 the fear and the self-fear and the self-doubt don't come from somewhere. They do. The interesting thing to me is, what is a legitimate and plausible attitude to have towards that now? Like, how do you make sure that a young German brought up today is not told that they have moral responsibility for what happened from 1939 to 1945? How do you get to the stage where it's not possible to blackmail all young German people into thinking that there's something in their DNA that's worse than anyone else's DNA that makes them go genocidal every few decades? <laughs> because we've got to find a way if, and I think for Europe, we have to find a way to have a much more plausible attitude towards Germany than we have. And I say this because in Britain and everywhere else, whenever there's an opportunity to have a pop at the Germans, we all do. But it, it's, it's not possible to talk about European civilization without talking about German civilization. And I think I might have mentioned this wrong when we last met. I've, I've thought about this a lot, and I've... Um, and not very many people, I think, are thinking about it, which is why I think we need to. Um, one of the very few things, again, I, uh, maybe from the, in this case, from the ridiculous to the sublime, but one of the few uh, times I have seen this answered in a very, very profound way was a few years ago at um, a performance in London of the Meister Singer von Nuremberg. And uh, it was a period dress production for once. You know, it wasn't the usual thing where I mean, he's saying, so usually a female director decides to have revenge on Wagner for something, <laughs> something so psychically deep, but anyhow. For once, it was a period dress production, it was really good. You didn't just have to sit there and close your eyes. Um, and it got to the end, and those of you who know the opera will know uh, there's this very, very difficult moment, about five, six minutes before the end, when, uh, uh, after the song competition, when we have this moment when uh, Hans Sachs says, you know, uh, this is a, our, our culture, we, you know, there are people from outside, and, uh, and we have to protect it, and all this, and, and as you know, the opera, you, you can't sit through that bit without feeling real uh, discomfort. <laughs> And so you sort of have to bear those couple of minutes, and then you get to the end, and it's all terrific. And, and, but I mention this because in this production, um, the most extraordinary thing happened. Everyone in the crowd watching the singing competition when this happened, when he starts to sing about German culture, they start to stand up with photographs of people from German culture. I think the first one was Stefan Zweig, mm -hmm. and then Rilke and Schubert, Lotte Lenya, Kurt Weill. It goes on and on and on. And I just, I was in floods of tears by the end of this. Because you thought, that is the answer. The answer is to, is to say to people, it's not, like, it's not, it's, it's not fair to look at the history of this continent, or this country, or that country, and always go to one thing, and always that, the absolute worst. It's not fair to have that attitude without also having that attitude of at least benign view. And we all know what the downside of this would be. The downside would be 
He said, let's find a way to get around the 20th century, sort of pretend it didn't happen, go back to <coughs> June 19... Well, you know, no, February 1914 or, or a date in the 30s, and let, let's go back there. But that's not possible. And the people, and there are people who are trying to do that kind of stuff. There are people like that trying to do that stuff at the moment. On the fringes, but they're there. Um, th that's not going to work. What could work is, as I say, find some kind of attitude towards that and this that is fair to ourselves and fair to this place. Because just a final thought of that, if I may, I, I, the second time I've completely failed to answer the question. Completely <laughs> failed. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even remember the question. <laughs> What was the question? <laughs> no, I forgot myself. <laughs> well, I hope you thought it was interesting. <laughs> um, yeah, I thought we'll come back to me. That's all your questions. <laughs> Can I make one comment? I, I want to say something about the right uh, to follow up since. Uh, this became too optimistic for me. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, first of all, I'm glad that we share a love of opera in the right way, you know, produced. So that's good. We don't have to. Uh, and, and I think I think that the, those productions are, are a symbol of that, right? Uh, the, the bad productions, where you have to shut your eyes to just listen to music. You're there to see the stage, and, and you can't because it's a diversion and it's disgusting and it's awful, and it happens way too often in in, in the U.S. But the rot. I think one of the, I mean, the most important places where the rot lives, if you will, is in the realm of ideas. So I believe ideas shape history. I, I, I really believe ideas shape history. It takes a long time sometimes, but, but we are products of the ideas that we embrace. And I think that until we come to an understanding of the ideas that brought us the 20th century, the ideas that brought us in particular communism and fascism, but until we can explain even World War I, really explain it, and then we can't get over it, because I think what has happened is, is I have an explanation, uh, which is rooted in, 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 in ideas that have to do with German romantic ideas, and maybe it is Germany again, I, I'm sorry, but it, you know the, those ideas came from there, and it's not an accident, I think. But until we understand why those ideas are bad ideas, why those ideas lead to the consequences that they do, then we can't really root out the rot. All it does is it, 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 it has this metamorphosis, it changes. So now we don't call it communism, now it's identity politics. It's not, uh, you know, uh, whatever the philosophy was. You know, now it's uh, postmodernism, we change the name. But it's basically, if you actually show that if you look at its heritage, it's the same ideas, just you know, rejiggled and modernized and changed. And I think we need to identify the rot where the rot really is. And in my view, the rot is in Kant, Hegel, Schopenhauer, Marx, Nietzsche, right? It's, it's in some way along that thread, and probably lots of people in between, that, that that is where the rot. And until we understand why it's rot and what it leads to ultimately, then we can't, then we're stuck in this constant pattern. And I don't think, you know, Kant's mission was to a large extent to destroy the Enlightenment, to repress the Enlightenment, to, to counter the Enlightenment, to save faith from the Enlightenment. And, it, you know, to a large extent, I think he succeeded. And I think that's the essential why We can't revive the Enlightenment until we understand its, it, you know, the attacks against it and have the weapons in our arsenal to be able to deal with those attacks. Well, there seems to be this massive hunger for shared purpose, and perhaps postmodernism is sort of an example of that, that it's a sort of a profane way of, of reproducing something that religion used to, yes. to provide. Absolutely. It, it's something to do. There's no doubt about it. It's something to do. And I've, I've been very, very struck by this in recent years. I was slightly slow on the uptake of exactly what was going on. I think I, I now get it. But... <laughs> This, what I describe as this attempt to put a new metaphysics into the structure. And what I'm saying is that sort of thing of, of life as an ongoing, endless battle to assert minority rights and the weaponization of everything. 
the politicization of everything. I'll give you a, a couple of quick examples of that uh, that have been on my mind recently. The Guardian, a well-known comic in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the Guardian ran a piece a few months ago about cycling deaths on the roads in the UK. Okay. What's the title of the piece? Why Roads Designed by Men Are Killing Women. Seriously. We've got to bring the sexist war into cycling deaths. <laughs> A uh, piece in the New York Times, November 2017, by a black contributor to the New York Times who writes a piece with the headline, Should I Allow My Children to Play with White Children? I'll give you a few weeks ago in the BBC, front page of the website, uh, is a story by a young girl of, who's black, mixed race, who's been offered a place at Cambridge, and the piece is, I've been offered a place at Cambridge, but I should, don't know if I should accept it because I'm black. And you go, <laughs> why the hell wouldn't you? Has, has Cambridge become some racist hellhole since I last went there? Has it become... I, my point is, this stuff, which is everywhere now in our culture, the weaponization of women against men, of men against women, of gays against heterosexuals, of heterosexuals against gays, of trans against everyone. <laughs> and the endless, the endless idea that our lives should be used best by being on social media and finding a person who's just subjected to something that was agreed upon until kind of yesterday, but didn't read that morning's bulletin and got it wrong, <laughs> and then can get their life torn asunder. But that, that's a good use of our time. That, that's a good use of our time. Now, again, a lot of people think that at the moment. A lot of people think, they will hopefully learn that this is a horrible, <coughs> horrible way to live, and that when they're on their deathbeds, <coughs> they will not look back with great pride of their lives and think of the Twitter storms they were part of. <laughs> Almost certain that that will not be something which they look back on as something of meaning. But my point is, is that it's something to do. And I think I said last time we met, I've been fascinated for a long time by this thing that our society has been for a while now, maybe one of the first societies in human history to have no overriding explanation for what we're meant to be doing here. Mm. And a lot of young people I know have this. It's like, maybe at some point somebody's gonna stand across my life and explain what it's all about. Now, everyone has had some of that at some point. We've all at some point in our lives have felt that. Somebody at some point will stand astride my life and tell me, Douglas, the point is X. And I'll go, oh, thank goodness for that. <laughs> so, but, but, so we all, we all have, my point is, is not the, the urge to have that happen. It's not the, the the question, it's not that. It's the fact that there's no answer. That there's not even an attempt to provide an answer. Which means, as I say, that's why when Iran mentioned with Islam, that's why I have the worry about Islam, because Islam has a very strong answer. Totally comprehensive answer to everything, from what you should do with a garment if you've peed on it, literally, in the hadith, to the meaning of everything. That's, that's for a lot of people, that's, that's just, that's very good stuff to have. You've got the book of meaning. Um, and I think that one of the great challenges that our societies have is to find a way to address that impulse. And all I know in the time being is to also steer people away from this politicization of everything. Because it is driving people mad. It's going to drive them a lot madder. And we've got to find a way out of it. Because that, and the identity politics, what is so dangerous about it, is this fact that you can see that when one group plays it, another group can play it back, and there's no reason not to. And you see the beginnings of that. But can that sense of a shared purpose be produced without an, an enemy? I mean, can you have the London Blitz spirit without the Blitz? 
I mean, can you compete with, well, with something which is like... I think it depends on what you mean by shared, shared purpose. I mean, so first I think every human being needs purpose and meaning. And this is what attracts them to some of these easy ways out. So the, the religion, particularly Islam, because Islam is so comprehensive. Ultra-Orthodox ultra Judaism does exactly the same thing. It tells you what you do when you wake up, what you do every minute of the day, and how you do it, and it solves all your problems. You never have to think for yourself again, and it gives you purpose in life. As, as, as secular cultures, we have to develop a language about purpose and meaning that doesn't depend on these ancient rituals, that, that doesn't depend on faith and religion. And, and you can see the desire for this in the success of, of Jordan Peterson. I mean, Jordan Peterson is massive. I don't know any public intellectual who's you know, bigger right now than him and fills stadiums and you know, thousands of people go see him. Why are they going to see him? Because I think he gives them some sense of meaning, purpose, uh, and he does it in the realm primarily of psychology and, and you know, half the time. I don't know what he's saying, but, but people get something very meaningful from what he is saying. They get a sense of they need to find meaning. They need to go out there and search for meaning. And it's not going to be easy like it is with these religions. So I think it depends on what it means by shared purpose. I, I, I don't know that the shared is necessary. I think what people really want is purpose. I think the shared is a lazy default. So I don't have to think about what I should do. I just have to look at what all white men do. Right? and follow the great white male leader who tells me what to do. Right? This is the lazy default of unthinking people. Um, and this is where we can, we can learn a little bit from, from, uh, from the Greeks or, or learn a little bit from our own history. We don't teach anymore what it means to live a good life. It, it, it returns back to the idea of Twitter. We don't, we don't teach how to seek out meaning and purpose because everybody has to find it. And, and we're afraid of that. It's again, you know, our values are no better than anybody else's values. So, so uh, you know, great art, you can't talk about great art because all art is the same. Once you put a urinal, urinal in a museum, there is no meaning to art. It's gone, everything's equalized, and all meaning is lost. We, 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 we have get, brought about egalitarianism to every dimension. No, some stuff is good and some stuff is crap. Some stuff is art, some stuff is just not art. It's a urinal. <laughs> and until we're willing to say that and differentiate and explain why and teach our kids to appreciate what it is, and then to tell them you have to go out and find your purpose in life, and it's not going to be exactly the same, it's not going to be shared, it's going to be you, and here's some tools on how to do it. 12 rules for living or whatever, right? Uh, but here's some tools to do it. But the purpose of your life should be to live a good life. What that means for you is not exactly the same as what it means, but the tools are fundamentally the same, and we're going to teach you those tools. And here are some virtues and values that are universal, that apply to all of you in your, in your quest for, uh, for, for a purpose and a meaning in life. And so I think, again, this is part of Western civilization that we've defaulted on. We used to teach some of this. We used to teach our kids in, in a more classic education some of these tools and some of these ideas and some of these principles. And we don't anymore. We, 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 let them, we leave them out there to float. We leave them out there to, everything is instant gratification. Everything is about right now. Uh, it, it, no one value is better than another. Everything is the same. And they, they land up on Twitter. Right? They land up in Twitter storms. They land up not capable of thinking. To me, that's what it's, at the end of the day, what it's really about is we don't teach critical thinking. We don't teach kids how to really think. And then we don't teach them how to differentiate and how to discriminate. You can't even, I mean, discrimination is bad, right? How to judge, right? How about, I mean, I, I get this a lot from young, young students. Oh, you can't judge. You can't judge other people. You're not supposed to judge. <laughs> Well, what's, well, well, how do you live if you don't judge? It's all about judging what's good for me, what's bad for me, who's a good guy, who's a bad guy, who's evil, who's right, who's wrong. Those are important things that you have to think about, talk about, discuss, and, and, and really think about. And no, we're not supposed to do that. 
you know? And, and as a consequence, we can't even bring up bad ideas because, oh, you know, they're good for those people. I mean, you look so eager. <laughs> <laughs> Many things there, I might agree. <laughs> but one thing is deconstruction. Deconstructing things is the modern idea of care. It's, it's what students are told at university, what they were in my time as well. But we've got to deconstruct things. This is, this is such a game. It is such a game. Uh, uh, deconstructing words, deconstructing sounds. How does this sound to a person of this background as opposed to how it sounds to self? Probably sounds the same. <laughs> um, but, but, I mean, if you wanted to define recent decades, certainly in thought, it would be the, the, the decades of deconstruction. And so, if we've done that game enough, and I would suggest we have done it more than enough, the question is, we need to, how do we start constructing again? What should we construct in our lives and as a society? If we've pulled everything apart, have we got any ability, among other things, to put back together again? Or are we like children with bicycles who can take them apart but have to call on an adult to put it back together? Um, is it that much fun to keep pulling everything apart without engaging in its opposite as well? Now, one, one way, by the way, when you're on, when you were saying this about uh, the, the need to judge, and the, I'm, I couldn't agree more. We need to find ways, ways in which to do it or to present it in a light, among other things, that, that is, is uh, uh, desirable. The reason why the judging thing happened is because, as, as Jonathan Haidt and uh, uh, um, his colleague wrote in their uh, recent book, that the, the, we have all started to imbibe an element of catastrophism uh, that, that means that the criticism of a person immediately means you're not just criticizing that person, you're denying that person, you're killing that person, you want to commit genocide against that person and everyone like yeah. them. Yeah. Yeah. Often there's a slightly softer version of that, which is you're making people like that kill themselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, this is, this is the means of blackmail that a whole set of ideas are, are being pushed forward on at the moment. So the catastrophism makes judgment impossible. But, but there are ways. I mean, here's one. I had a great friend who died some years ago, a publisher called George Weidenfeld, who actually fled uh, Vienna in the 30s. And uh, he had spent his whole life in publishing, published um, uh, Nabokov, Graham Greene, and, and I once said to him at the very end of his life, uh, what, what he thought had changed most in culture at the time. He had such an interesting answer. He said, I thought about it a bit, he said, the thing that is most interesting that has changed is, he said, when I was, you know, growing up and, and, and throughout his life, he said, there was this, always this thing of highbrow, lowbrow, middlebrow. Now, some of you will remember this. It, it, was, it, it, it was, in a way, it was a game of its own. There was highbrow culture. There was, there was, is X, like, is Graham Greene slipping from highbrow to middlebrow? Yeah. It's a sort of game that you can end endless book pages with, this sort of stuff. But there was, there was something good built into it, wasn't there? Which was that it, it discriminated between the better, the, the, the best, the, the kind of fine and the slightly shameful, you know, I, I read a really lowbrow novel the other day. But we all, we all, we all know that the thing is we have no categories for this anymore. And it was in itself, as I say, it's almost like irritating cat a set of categories. But it had, we all know exactly that sort of thing. We all know that there are books that we read because we think at some level they're improving. And that there are books that we know that we won't get any improvement from, but you know, they're fine. And that's the same with films and with all sorts of things. So we do have some kind of recognition still. It's just, we don't know what the rules are. And that, as you say, is because nobody's, nobody's taught even the basics. And this is, this is uh, but by the way, I'm not, I'm not actually, if I just quickly say, I'm not pessimistic about that for one, <laughs> for one reason in particular, which is that um, one of the most important figures in my life is T.S. Eliot. And uh, he, I learned from reading Eliot 
something so important, which is that you can revive a culture even after midnight. Let me give you a very practical example of this. Um, Eliot makes a lot of references to Dante. And by my generation, most school children, certainly in England, would not read Dante at school. But we would read a bit of Eliot. And by the time you leave school, you would have heard of Dante because of Eliot. Mm -hmm. My point is, is that the one person who goes back and brings back the dead provides them anew to the living. And this is an astonishing thing which Eliot demonstrated, but it is demonstrated at a lesser level all the time. And what I, what I suppose I want most of that is to say, not to put people off by saying you have to know the entire canon before you can even start to contribute or anything like that, because always nobody does, in fact nobody ever did. But, but the point is, is to say this is something really worth being a part of. Excellent. So, now we have 20 minutes to go, and it's time for the audience to pose their questions, if they have any. And no sermons, please. Questions, if you have any. <coughs> I will be a lot less nice to you than I have been to them, if you're not being brief. Just so you know. I don't know who's got the microphone. Okay. Okay, so you will just have to um, be loud. Yeah. Uh, I have a question for this group, and uh, that is, uh, I'm a fan of an Ayn Rand uh, fan, most of my life, and I'm also a Meryl Brook fan. And uh, the thing I have very much difficulty in, in reconciliating is that Ayn Rand actually was uh, very much into, uh, she was against naturalism, and she was also uh, taught a lot about uh, people should be free to migrate all over the world. And it's, it, it, that seems plausible at the beginning, but what you say, uh, uh, what you say, and what, what is terribly evident here in Sweden, it, it's not really a good idea in, in practice. So, what, well, the question would be, what would Ayn Rand say today, or how do you, we can see, you don't know if that's a silly question, but how, how do you yourself reconciliate that, because... Yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't speak fine, man, no. um, and certainly not from the dead, so... Um, <laughs> I will tell you how I view it. I, I, I think that in a, so let me start with a free society. I think in a free society, in a truly free society, people have a right to migrate and they have a right to cross as long as they're not violating other people's rights. There is no, there should be no real restrictions. Again, you, you have to monitor who's coming and who's not to make sure that, you know, the bad guys are not coming. But, but, but generally, I don't believe government should get into the business of ideas and the government shouldn't get into the business of culture and preserving ideas and preserving culture because we, we know where that can lead when the government is in the hands of the people we don't happen to like, which is, in my case, all the time. Um, so I, I think that you can't make those in a truly free society. The problem is, of course, we don't live in a free society. We live particularly here in Europe, and certainly in America as well, in welfare states, where massive redistribution of wealth, and not only that, but the immigrants are not just coming, they're coming and they're getting a check, they're coming and they're getting a, a, a house in, or, or a condominium here in, in Sweden where you guys can't even afford, but, but they get ahead of you on the line and they get it before you do, and it's public housing and the state is also building that. And on top of that, they're coming here in masses, right? They're not just coming one at a time, they're coming in huge numbers from a region at war, which is, which is, uh, which is ideologically and culturally quite primitive. And I think, I think if you take all of that into account, then one has to say, in, given the mixed economy, given where we are, limitations on that have to be placed. Now, I would like to see one day the welfare state eliminated and, you know, freedom reign and everything like that, and all of that would be great. And that should be, that is the priority that I engage with. But given that all this exists, and given the mass migration, and given the, 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 the violence, given the terrorism, given we know what is coming and the numbers, the sheer numbers that are coming, some constraints have to be placed. Now, how big are those constraints and so on? 
I don't think it's easy because it's it's not the whole the whole setup is not right. <laughs> the whole setup is not right from beginning to end. There's injustice here as well, you know, of, of of redistributing people's wealth to begin with and all of that. Plus, philosophically, as I said in the beginning, we're not in a position to be defending our own values, so there's no assimilation. I think the situation is a lot different in the United States. I think my general view of the United States is it's still a welfare state, so there's still problems like that. But my general view in the United States is if you can if you can get if you can get a job, and maybe this is good for Europe as well, if you can show that you have a job in the United States, you should get a visa to come in five years, whatever. Don't allow them to vote. Don't, you know, you can make all kinds of restrictions in terms of what they can do. They don't get welfare for life. I don't care, right? But if you have a job, you should come in. And I think it would be healthy for America. I think it's good, and I think it. It kind of protects us from the welfare state problems, and at the same time, it allows for what I consider a healthy migration uh, of people that they want to work, that they want to provide for their families. Uh, you know, I again, I'm an immigrant, so take it for what it will. I admire immigrants. I admire people, and I admire immigrants from anywhere, including many of the people, not all, but many of the people come from the Middle East. I mean, their life sucks where they are. They get up and they want to make a better life for themselves. Cool, that, that, that's exactly what it should be, right? All of us want to make a better life for ourselves, and I respect when other people do that. It saddens me that we live in a world where we have to make restrictions on that, And but I think in Europe's case, you have to do it, and in America's case, I think you have to do it, but at a much, much, much smaller scale, because the, the culture's not threatened, the economy's not threatened, all of those I don't think, oh, oh, I think they're all straw man. I think the only issue there is the issue of the welfare state. Yes, thank you. Uh, does society have an obligation to people who genuinely can't take care of themselves? Yeah. Um, is that what is? Or, uh, I assume, given the nature of the question, probably. But uh, what do you mean by society? Right? I mean, I always ask. I always ask an audience this simple question: How many of you? If there were people, if there was a group over there that truly could not take care of themselves and was struggling, how many of you would be willing to help them? And almost every hand in the room goes up. Almost everybody, right? Um, and it says, so take care of them. So, 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 what do we need? A superstructure that involves coercion, that involves force, that involves redistributing wealth, and of course, that group over there keeps growing because once we have a bureaucracy that is in charge of, of feeding them and clothing them and housing them, there's an incentive to, to create greater and greater need, and there's always somebody in need. Let the needy, those who need something, appeal to our charity, and if they really are needy, if they really cannot take care of themselves, and even if they're not, we're often very, I think people are incredibly benevolent, particularly free people, and are happy to help when help is needed. What I'm opposed to is coercion. What I'm opposed to is the state doing it and coercing it into, into doing it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A question that uh, you can in your sort of emails of higher education. Uh, you both spoke some of postmodernism, uh, but, but like, given the state of universities today, what future do you see, uh, like, what positive future do you see? Uh, like, at the universities? It, universities and ideas, like, these I, ideas of the Western civilization is really something that is taught, it, it ought to be taught in, in universities, Aristotle and, and Plato and, and the ideals of the I am, civilization. I, I, I sometimes get, uh, I left Oxford in 2001, and I was already very down about academia for all sorts of reasons, but one reason was that I suddenly, as the world became very interesting again, as it did in 2001, I was very struck by the fact that on almost no question did anyone say, we should find out what, they're say, what they say in academia about this. Nobody was saying, we really need a professor to answer that question. Now, I'm, I'm not saying this as an attack on the entire question. What I'm saying is there was something that at different times different people picked up, that it wasn't that useful to society in some of the ways that we had thought it might be. And every time, with the exception of some of the sciences, but with, every time you, you thought of a problem, 
the universities near you were the last place you would have gone for an answer. And people started to work this out for themselves. And then the positive thing happens was people then get access to the information themselves and they get it on the internet. Now, I remember when the internet started, people were, there was all of that phase of, you know, well, wow, it's just going to be like a library. Children just jumping around, finding out information, just like they always did in libraries. <laughs> <laughs> and then everyone realized it was mainly pornography and cat videos. <laughs> but that's, we've got beyond that now, because, I, and I, you, you probably agree, you're on, I mean, I'm just stunned by the level of knowledge that somebody can have now for basically just having access to YouTube. Or, you know, using social media well. I mean, so this, and, and it really is happening, in my view. It, it, it's coming about. So that, that is the place I'm... And, and it, it, it's a, so it's a simultaneous thing. It also helps you see through what I described in academia faster. And my hope at some stage is that there ends up being a financial imperative caused by that, i.e. that the universities actually end up having trouble because they're not providing what people want. Now, once this happens in all sorts of places at all sorts of speeds, but as I <coughs> joked recently in an interview, you know, uh, uh, when your future Chinese boss demonstrates to you that he's not interested in your masters in lesbian dance. <laughs> you will have met too late the sad reality of something you chose to do in your life. Now, that's, it's not such a preposterous suggestion because the fact is that the universities have for a long time been holding out a lot of frauds, a lot of fraudulent claims, a lot of fraudulent promises, mm -hmm. degrees in things that cannot help you. And when people suffer, and very quickly giving an example, there's a, there's, I wrote about this last year, there's a set of very good learning moments that have happened in the last couple of years with this. Brett Weinstein's uh, uh, treatment at Evergreen College. We all saw it, we were all appalled by it, but the admissions to Evergreen have been falling since by catastrophic proportions for that university. I, there's a price to pay for becoming a social justice warrior breeding institution. You're providing no service to society. You're making parents remortgage their houses to make their kids stupider and, and nasty and bitter and vindictive and evil and violent. So there's a price to pay. See if you want to pay it. Wilfrid Laurier University in Canada after the Lindsay Shepherd affair. Same thing. Same thing at several other universities now. So my hope is that, that actually the learning that is being encouraged online is going to be one of the things that will help the institutions that claim to be places of learning to actually have to either become what they hold themselves out to be or to shut. I, I mean, I agree with that with one caveat. I, I, I think universities are still unbelievably important negative, and have a negative influence. So it's true that in 2011 the idea wasn't we're going to go to the universities, but the universities were already there. So the generals who actually fought on the battlefield were already trained by the universities and fought in a particular war in a way. And for example, just war theory, which I think is, a, is an abomination, particularly in its modern form, was, was, was already inculcated in them and they were, they were guided by that. The media, the media which had a particular view of the world and a particular attitude towards the world, say, it's the media's fault, right? They're too leftist or whatever. Well, where did they get that from? They got that from, 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 the, from the universities. And at the end of the day, when they bring expert witnesses on, they're usually people who at some point interacted extensively with the universities. So, I think that this is right in terms of where we're heading, but the universities are still sent, uh, incredibly important centers that influence the culture in subtle ways. They teach the teachers of your kids. Now that should really scare you, right? So, so teachers' colleges at the universities, at least in the United States. So the, the ideas from there are, are, are going out into the culture in indirect ways all the time. And until I think either they are crushed into non-existence, or they are replaced, or something dramatic happens. And I think technology is going to do it. I think technology ultimately 
Well, just like it's doing to taxi drivers, it will do to university professors at some point. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much for the um, presentation and the discussion. It's been really enlightening. This, uh, this talk, I guess, is being recorded. So in 20 years from now, students will probably look at this and, and <laughs> see a summary about what happened and what we thought back then, right? You have like five minutes left, I guess, of this presentation. It would be super interesting if you to make a prediction and a guess about where Europe will go in the next 20 years. I mean, put your, uh, put your uh, fame and fortune here on the line and, and <laughs> hear what you think will actually happen to Europe and Western democracies. And the patient is you. I'll be very quick so we can get another question. Um, <laughs> I actually say, uh, I'm not dodging the question, I actually say, I said it this afternoon on the radio, I, I don't make predictions because I think it's a very foolish thing to do. Let me, the world was always complex. But this world where it's so complicated that I, you, you don't know what the causality will be from anything, really. I mean, you know, the, the, the person who sends out a joke on Twitter and ends up losing everything in their life, like, we didn't know that could happen at all very recently. There's, there's lots of stuff we're still, we're having to learn very fast. But we don't know the, con we never did know the consequences of actions, which is why forgiveness was always so important. Because you had to have something to deal with the unbelievably catastrophic impossibility of knowing how your actions in the world would impact on it. Mm -hmm. But this world, as I say, is even more. The one thing is, I, I just says, it's all possible. It is all possible. Your darkest, worst nightmares, all possible. All the catastrophism, eminently possible. Eminently possible. I see so many ways. I write about some of them in the book, but. I've got plenty of others of how this goes wrong. <laughs> and that's why I say, this is why I say always when I speak to politicians about this, this book and the subject matter, I always say the same thing. All I'm really urging you to be is careful. Mm. Careful with our future, careful with your future. Mm. That's all. Mm. Uh, just be more careful with it. Don't, don't, you know, even more once said that reading the prose of Stephen Spender was, was like watching um, a Sevre vase in the hands of a chimpanzee. <laughs> and this is, this is like watching our future being handled by a chimpanzee. Just, it's just willing to break the whole thing. So just be careful is my one bit of advice. But the other thing is, it all depends only on people. Only on people. They're just, the whole of history, I know again this is not the way in which history is meant to be taught these days, the whole of history is just people doing things or not doing things, standing up or not standing up, uh, taking a risk or not taking a risk. And you know, maybe in Denmark everything will go great or everything will go bad and maybe it will be the opposite way around in Sweden. It will all just depend on the people. The people you produce, the people you are. Whether or not you decide to be cowards, whether you decide to be silent, whether you decide to be cowed, bullied, blackmailed, and much more, or whether you decide not to be. And say to hell with that. I mean, the extraordinary thing about this, about this situation we're in is that we find ourselves, as the late uh, philosopher Ken Minogue once said, we find ourselves in this position where we, the public, end up feeling like we proved to be a disappointment to our politicians. <laughs> <laughs> we think the wrong things, often we say them. We don't get up to speed fast enough. Many of us have the wrong views and we vote for the wrong parties. It's amazing they put up with us, really. <laughs> oh, he's taking up all my time. I can't predict. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me another question. Yes. Uh, preferably a yes or no question. <laughs> um, so, you talked about the, uh, the void of personal uh, responsibility 
and the, the, the sense of self is being lost. And I'm, I'm thinking, do you think that and, and moral, you know, moral judgment as a person, you know, how moral you are, do you think that this is displaced with, for example, if you only think this way, if you only are good to this root or something, you know, the fuel of their dance do you think that it's displaced by that? Do you think that people, you know, get the sense of a moral person, of a good person by, you know, being preached? In a particular, you know, if you are only like this, then you are a good person in a way. You know, it's, it's, it's Yes, I mean, look, the purpose is something we need as human beings to be successful in life. We need to have a purpose. Morality is something we need as human beings. We need, we need a, a, a guidepost. We need to know what is right and what is wrong, what, what, what behaviors will lead in, in one direction, what behaviors lead in another direction. These are things that, that, that human nature were built for that because of a particular type of consciousness we have. We, we need guideposts. We can't handle the barrage of stuff. We need principles. And that's what identity politics and that's what every authoritarian and that's what every uh, uh, you know collectivist feeds off of. Right? Um, so you, they know you need purpose. Here's a purpose. Right? Here. You know. Uh, fight for your blackness or whatever, or your whiteness or your grayness or, or whatever it is, and and uh, derive your morality from your identity, right? And uh, every racist group has ever done this, and again, left, right, doesn't really matter here. And uh, it, but every collectivist, you know, he is the proletarian. You know, they will give you purpose, and, and since we don't know exactly what the proletarian needs, I will tell you, and just follow me, and you'll be a moral good person. And this is, this is, I think, what made Western civilization unique, to go back to that, is the Western civilization broke with that attitude, because that's an ancient attitude. That goes back to the tribe, right? We're all in the tribe, and what do we do? Uh, you know, again, purpose, well, you gotta live for the tribe. And who knows what's good for the tribe? Well, I do, and my witch doctor over here who communes with the spirits and will let us all know what's good for the tribe. And, then, and, and morality is not living for yourself, or for your happiness, or for your success. Morality is living for the tribe. So there you go. You've got the whole package wrapped up nicely. Just follow my orders, and you'll and you'll be good. And there's an afterlife, so don't worry about anything. Right? So I mean, that's been and 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 then came the enlightenment and said, no, <laughs> you are an end in itself. You, the individual. Your purpose is not external to you. It's not a group purpose. It's not a shared purpose. It's your purpose as an individual. Go pursue, wow, what a thought. Go pursue your happiness. The pursuit of happiness is something that, that we, we, because I think today happiness has become a, you know, a relevant thing. I mean, you Swedes are unbelievably happy. Um, you used to tell all the survey, because, because we've, we've, I think, I think we've, um, you know, as compared to Eudemonia, kind of the, the, the Greek idea of human flourishing and being as successful as a human being. Happiness today has, has, has been, you know, it, it seems less significant. But the idea of a pursuit of happiness, the pursuit of a good life, the pursuit of life, of living, of living fully to a full capacity as a human being, that idea is the idea of the enlightenment. That idea is a Western idea. The idea is you as an individual go out there, live, and we will create a political system that allows you to do that. That's the whole idea of freedom, and 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 and, and uh, it is to leave you free, to protect you from the bad guys, from the crooks, the criminals, the invaders, so that you, the virtuous individual, can pursue your life, your happiness, to live the fullest, most complete life possible to a human being. That is the vision of the Enlightenment. That's what the Enlightenment made possible. Again, before that, we were all subsistence farmers. We didn't know happiness. We didn't know anything. Right? Suddenly, art was available to the middle class. Art, you know, all these values became real to every one of us as individuals. And that's what we need to recapture, that sense of individualism. And to, to just to go, I know I have to cut, right? just one thing about prediction, right? The danger is that we revert to different tribes, that we restructure things and go back to our tribe, because that's the easy way out. That's it. And that's, that's what we have to resist in terms of if we're gonna get out of this sane and alive and well. It's, it's, it's to find those individualistic values. That doesn't mean you don't do stuff with other people. That's ridiculous, right? Other people are an enormous value to any individualist. Um, but that we find purpose, that we find morality, 
and we got we use that morality to live the best lives that we can live. That I think is what saves Europe. That's I think what saves Western civilization, and that's what everyone can do in his own life. Going back to the idea, it's people. That's what you can do in your life, and in that sense, you're affecting Western civilization, Western culture, because you're living your life to the best of your ability. Okay. Douglas Murray, Mary Brooks, a warm welcome back. I have to say thank you so much for tonight and thank you so much for all of you. Thank you.